our first three presenters are Olivia Otter, uh, Haley Serpa, and Ali Tupai, and they're going to be presenting on their research entitled What Mode and Dosage of Exercise Improves Function and Pain Level in Middle-Aged Adults with Knee Osteoarthritis. They were advised by Dr. Amy Veras, and their reader was Dr. Shalane Shattuck. Thank you, Dr. Shevin. OA affects 5% of the adult population worldwide, with knee OA accounting for approximately 80% of OA cases. Patients with knee OA experience pain and loss of function through various everyday activities. These patients seek medical treatment, either conservative or end or surgical, and hope to return to their prior level of function without pain. These costs have become significant and can total over $140,000 during a lifetime and are targeted to continue to increase over the years. Total knee arthroplasties have been a popular treatment method, but approximately 20% of these patients experience persistent knee pain. Exercise has been identified as a treatment that is beneficial for OA symptoms, but many patients fear exercise will exacerbate their symptoms and cause them to experience pain during activity. Next slide, please. Our patient was a 57-year-old male with persistent right knee pain following a traumatic injury. He fell off a one and a half meter scaffold two years prior to seeking treatment. He con his condition progressed over the two years and now are consistent with knee away. He was fiercely active before the fall. He ran with his daughter, skied, and took care of his personal farm. His significant medical history consists of hypertension and a BMI of 27.9, classifying him as overweight. His lower extremity function score was 66% and his pain varied from one to seven on the numeric pain rating scale. His, return, his goal was to return back to his daily activities without pain, resume running and skiing and managing his weight. With the patient and previous research in mind, the purpose of this research study was to identify an optimal mode and dosage of exercise to improve function and pain in middle-aged adults with knee away. Thank you, next slide. Following some PICO revisions, the search process for updated PICO began February 2020 and continued through July. We accepted articles which targeted middle-aged adults with knee osteoarthritis and evaluated the health outcomes of interest, which were pain and function. Articles were only included if they followed subjects for three or more months, and they consisted of a head-to-head -head comparison of different exercise protocols. The databases that we found to be the most useful were Pedro and Medline, after combining various keywords, such as exercise, pain, function, and knee OA, we performed a total of 45 searches, yielding 1,757 results, of which 82 article titles were saved. After reviewing the abstracts, 36 articles remained. And after applying the inclusion-exclusion criteria, seven full-text articles were reviewed, of which three articles met all acceptance criteria. Next slide, please. The first article we included by Dong et al. was a meta-analysis which included eight RCTs comparing aquatic exercise to land-based exercise. The second article published by Smith et al. was a systematic review which included 10 RCTs comparing a variety of different exercises such as isometric versus isotonic, concentric versus concentric eccentric, aerobic versus strengthening, weight-bearing versus non-weight-bearing, high intensity versus low intensity, and high resistance versus low resistance. And the third article we included was an RCT published by Alcatan et al. This study compared cycling to swimming. All included exercise interventions found significant improvements in functional outcomes and pain. However, there appears to be no significant difference between exercise interventions on the outcomes of pain and function. Next slide, please. Based on these results, we recommend that patients gradually build up to exercising 50 minutes a day, three times a week, at a moderate intensity measured through heart rate reserve, shooting for a target of 50 to 70 percent of reserve. If patients can exercise at this intensity for three or greater months, they will see improvements to pain and function. Unfortunately, our articles didn't really conclude strongly about modes of exercise, but they didn't find any significant differences between different modes. However, they were very homogeneous, focusing mostly on aquatic therapy and cycling. So we would like to, in the future, see more research on activities that are really impactful on the joint, such as running, or activities that integrate more cognitive pieces, such as yoga. We also would like to see more research on direct comparisons of exercises for special populations. A lot of research currently focuses on 
overweight, older um, adult females. We, while that population is at a greater risk of knee osteoarthritis, that does not fit every description of each patient. So we would like to see more research on broader populations as well as long-term follow-up. A lot of research goes at most a year long, but this is a disease that really follows patients for the duration of their lifetime. Next slide, please. We also want to urge physical therapists to integrate other pieces of evidence-based practice into their exercise prescription, such as patient preferences. It's really important that therapists work with their patients to talk about what time they have to dedicate to exercising, as well as what resources are available to them and what they really enjoy in order for them to adhere to the program. But they also need to use clinical judgment as far as what is their level of function and how can we progress towards this dosage. Many patients have become sedentary over time, so it's going to take a while before they can build up to that exercise prescription, but adherence is really the key to getting patients better. We need to be educating patients that pain doesn't always cause damage to tissue and that it's going to take a little while before the joint starts to feel better, but if they stick to it and use strategies such as a workout buddy or they keep an activity log, they will eventually see improvements in their symptoms. We will now open the floor to any questions. Okay, our first question. Um, you indicated that the literature has a paucity of information regarding influence of comorbidities. Um, the questioner is wondering if there were any indicators of covariates with respect to best modality of exercise. Your patient's BMI was approximately 28. Does that make a difference? So at this time, there's really not a lot of research into subpopulations, like there's specific comorbidities. Something really wanna see is as far as like cardiovascular health. As far as BMI, we're seeing that patients are more likely to be adverse to exercise if they have an increased BMI, but there's also always the issue of BMI isn't the best health indicator. It's really to capture the overall population health. Great, another question. This is from Dr. Futrell. In my experience, patients either can't or don't want to get into a pool. It's a hassle for them. What are your thoughts on socioeconomic status and access to pool for aquatic exercise? Is there a less costly or more accessible alternative? Yeah, an issue with aquatic therapy is, is adherence or is um, access, sorry. And um, we mentioned that as it would be a barrier for some patients. And um, unfortunately, in our literature, we didn't find much information on healthcare, on the cost of cost difference between different um, interventions on the treatment of OA. Right, next question from Dr. Shevin. How would it change your approach to exercise if instead of viewing the patient as an individual with OA, you saw him or her as an individual with persistent pain? A lot of that comes back to patient education and really helping them to understand what's going on at the structures and understanding this is going to be a problem they'll have for probably the duration of their life, that we can't necessarily make all the pain go away, but really focusing on what we can accomplish as far as maybe when you first started coming to therapy, you weren't able to even get your shoes on, but now you still have pain with stairs, but you're more independent. Is it possible that the answer to your PICO question isn't in the empirical literature at all? If so, what is the bottom line suggestion for a clinician working with a patient who has had knee OA for many years? Again, this is a follow-up from Dr. Shen. So, so one of the other limitations in the research was the difference in the severity of the OA and the duration of their symptoms. They varied from having OA very mild to um, not very severe. A lot of the conditions cut out the severe, uh, a lot of the articles cut out the severe conditions. So then that was a limitation in our research that we would like to see more literature 
include those studies and compare head to head on the different severities of our, our research also showed like the longer you've had osteoarthritis the more exercise adverse you are likely to be so it's really about just the small gradual build up and it might take a really long time before they're able to hit that mark of 50 minutes three times a week but it, the low intensity exercises can also see improvements and one of our studies from alcatan at all suggested for the small gradual build up to start with 20 to 30 minutes a day for three times a week at um, 40 to 50 percent of intensity. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one more question from the group. Exercise adverse is tricky to manage. Any suggestions specifically for the patient who's exercise adverse who maybe walks into your clinic? What would you do first? Um, so I think progression and starting at a level that's appropriate for the patient, um, taking into consideration all the patient characteristics, um, their previous level of activity, other comorbidities, et cetera. Also patient education um, would be important too on things like delayed muscle soreness. As well as finding what really motivates the patient to become active again. What can we do to help them really stick to adhering to exercise, as well as we found research supporting that cognitive behavioral therapy can be effective. So really referring out and making sure they have the resources they need. Are there any more questions? No more questions. Great. All right, thank you. Excellent presentation. We'll move on to our second presenter group this, this morning. And so if the first presentation group can mute your speak your microphones, and if the second presentation group could unmute right now. Okay, so our second group this morning is um, Taylor Field and Kelsey Orpin. Uh, they'll be presenting their work entitled In English Speaking Adults Is Kolb's LSI, The Atlas, The Vark, or Gregor's Style Delineator the Best Assessment Tool to Determine Learning Style in Order to Effectively Educate a Patient? And this group was uh, their faculty advisor was Professor Deborah Pelletier, and their reader was Dr. Abby Mulligan. Thank you. So a little bit of background on our research. There are many learning style assessment tools out there, and these tools serve to help us understand how someone learns best, how they receive information the most effectively, and how the learner perceives and responds to a learning environment. And by assessing a patient's learning style, it could help therapists potentially better understand their patients, improve patient therapist communication, and allow for a more personal interaction. Most of these tools are not appropriate for the clinic for various reasons, one of them being their length. Some tools would take too much time out of a short outpatient session, and when time during a visit is limited, a shorter tool would be more beneficial. Our clinical decision was based on the psychometric properties of these tools, and for this research, we chose to focus on reliability and validity statistics. These tools were chosen based on the preliminary research showing that the tool's characteristics were best suited for the clinic and easiest to use by the patient or therapist. The four tools we chose to focus our research on were the Kolb's LSI, the Atlas, the Bark, and Gregorx style delineator. Next slide, please. So our patient is a 29-year-old male who has recently fallen when attempting to catch his daughter and was diagnosed with a high-level ankle sprain. Currently, his pain is an 8 out of 10, and he, he's unable to weight bear for more than 10 minutes. The patient has a history of ankle fractures and sprains and is showing severe fear avoidance behaviors. We want him to reach his personal goals and get back to his everyday fatherly roles while also meeting his goals for therapy. Our goal with this research is to effectively educate the patient to improve his function and decrease his risk of re-injury. This led us to the purpose of our research, which is to determine the best assessment tool to establish learning style in order to effectively educate a patient. Next slide, please. All right, so for our methods, we followed a very standard search protocol. The databases we use and the keywords are shown here on the slide. We would like to point out a database that was new to us, which is ERIC. 
ERIC is an educational database often used by teachers and educators, and we found it, it, we found it provided us with a lot of good research for our topic. Some article inclusion and exclusion criteria are listed here as well in the chart. Some things to note is that we only included articles with study participants ages 18 to 65. Reasons for this being we needed to be able to generalize our results back to our patient, as well as we wanted to exclude studies done with kids and teens in school. We also wanted to exclude individuals with intellectual disabilities and dementias, because in order to get the most accurate results from the tool, the user needs to be able to read and comprehend each test item. In the blue box below, you can see our results. Our nine primary search strings yielded 551 articles, most of which were excluded through title and abstract scanning. Then further exclusions were made through inclusion and exclusion criteria. This left us with a total of 12 articles, which we appraised and selected four of those to help us make our clinical decision. Next slide, please. Okay, so this chart shows the four final articles we chose for our clinical decision. We were able to narrow down our final article selection from 12 to four, because in the eight articles we excluded, most of the data was repeated in the two systematic reviews shown here. Next slide, please. So based on our research, our clinical decision is the ATLAS, which stands for Assessing the Learning Styles of Adults, because it had the best psychometric properties for test, retest reliability, and contract validity out of the four tools. The ATLAS is short, which is suitable for the clinic setting, and is geared towards adults, which is relatable to our patient case. This can be taken in person with pen and paper or virtually online. It's also easy to understand and interpret. These items are based on real life situations that determine how someone learns best, but also gives tips and information on how the therapist can best relay that information and educate their, pace, their patient based on the type of learner the tool says they are. The research on this tool is limited to the tool's creator who also established the psychometric properties in his research. Another author from a doctoral dissertation found very similar results regarding reliability and validity statistics, which does give us hope. And learning style assessment tools, including the Atlas, should also be explored within the telehealth world to see if the same benefits can take place over video chat. Next slide, please. All right, so now to discuss the clinical importance and relevance of our research. Uh, we know that patient-centered care is an aspect of evidence-based practice, along with evidence and clinical expertise that cannot be overlooked. Although a therapist may already be providing some aspects of patient-centered care for their patients, and they may already be getting good results, we believe adding a learning style assessment tool into that plan of care will help to improve patient satisfaction as well as patient outcomes. Learning style assessment tools such as the ATLAS are a great way to build rapport and learn more about a patient. As a therapist, altering your teaching style to accommodate the needs of each patient shows that patient that you're invested in them and you care about their treatment and their progress. And as Kelsey mentioned earlier, we also wanted to note that as telehealth emerges as a more common form of treatment delivery, especially in the outpatient setting, um, tools such as the Atlas can help build a better patient therapist relationship, especially when cues such as body language and eye contact may be lacking. However, this is an area of study where more research still needs to be done. Thank you, and we will now open the floor to questions. So question one from Dr. Futrell, how would you implement a learning assessment tool? Would you use paperwork at initial evaluation? So the Atlas can be used either right before a session with pen and paper, or they can take it um, before they come in. We also thought about before, the session, um, taking it virtually so that the therapist can have the results before the patient comes in and kind of plan ahead of time. Um, but yeah. And the great thing about the Atlas too is that you are able to do it online and it's only three questions. So it's really um, quick and easy for the patient to take and really easy to interpret as well because at the end of the tool, it provides the name of their learning style. It provides a little description of their learning style. And it also gives tips and tricks on how the therapist or the educator um, can best educate that type of learning style. Question from Dr. Shevin. Can we look at the slide 
with the atlas on it and have you walk us through the constructs being asked. Sure. Um, so I'm sorry the print is kind of small. Our plan was just to kind of show um, kind of how the flow chart works. But basically, um, each option gives you two options that branch off of it. And at the end, you can either be a navigator, a problem solver, or an engager. Um, so the problem solver kind of likes to solve problems. They like to find out um, what their problems are and look at the, um, the options that are in front of them and lay the problems out and then kind of work through, um, work through their problems that way. The engager is kind of an emotional learner. Um, so they like to um, learn about things they care about. So for therapy, we would want to make sure that they know why um, we would want to make sure they know why we're teaching them what we are so they can care about what they're learning about. And then for the, the navigator, I believe they're the ones who um, like to set out a plan and a schedule. And for that, they like the um, therapist, it would be helpful if um, they set a plan saying we're going to do this this day, this the next day. Um, and so on. That way the patient can follow a schedule and um, just keep track of things that way because it helps them to learn better. Great. A few more questions. Based on your research, do you think you'll give the atlas to each patient pre-treatment? Will you suggest this to your CIs as you go out to your clinicals? So from some therapists we have talked to, um, some do use it and like it, think it um, helps their ther therapy sessions. And there are a lot a therapist who don't use it. Um, we talked about this a little. We think that it wouldn't do any harm to give to a patient before the session since it, this tool only takes one to three minutes. Um, so I think it would be a good idea to suggest to our CI as we go on clinicals if they don't use it. Great. Another question from Zach. Has the research told you about current PT awareness of the Atlas tool? How would you go about increasing its usage in all clinics? Oops. Um, well, we actually did not find any current research about using the Atlas in the therapy um, in the therapy setting, but I think something we can do just to start to increase awareness about the tool is just to talk to our CIs about it and just to see if they're using any sort of similar tools or, um, yeah, just see how we can help them to incorporate it in the clinic and go on from there. Another question from Griffin. Did you find any evidence suggesting that different learning assessment tools would work better or worse in different clinical settings? So we did look at this a little bit. Um, there wasn't any specific research on different settings. Um, our focus for our research was on the outpatient setting, but we don't see any reason why this couldn't be used in um, various settings um, with all patients. Are there costs to purchase these tools? Or are they free for therapists to use? The Atlas is actually free to use. That's another reason why we decided to choose it in the end. Um, the I believe the only tool that was not free out of the four that we chose was Greg Works. And for that one, you actually needed to buy a little packet um, in order for the patient to take it. Great. From Sydney, is there a language barrier for the Atlas? Is it available in multiple languages and has it been validated in multiple languages? Um, this tool, from what we have read in our research, um, hasn't been validated in multiple languages. Um, and that's why in our exclusion criteria, we actually did say that English speakers needed to um, be the ones in the studies since this tool was in English. Great. And a question from Dr. Kaufman. Did your source research reflect the clinical context for these tools, especially with respect to the clinical importance you described? Is there evidence of added value that comes from application of your recommended tool in actual clinical settings? Uh, for that, yes, we did find one really important article. Um, we actually couldn't use it in to uh, support our clinical decision because technically it did not include a reliability or validity statistic but we did it um, in our background and discussion. And the it was actually used in an outpatient setting for patients with back pain. And they used the Atlas to help um, educate them on their home exercise programs. And they, um, 
they had created a tool where they could measure their performance on their home exercise programs. And the patients who were educated with the Atlas actually performed their home exercise plans better than those who were not, were just given um, typical education from the therapists. Great, and a question from Dr. Veras. Did you find evidence that supports how this improves therapeutic alliance between patient and therapist? Um, so we did find some research stating that using this tool did improve patient satisfaction and like Taylor said, their performance with exercise. So it made their um, experience with therapy overall a better experience. Um, so the fact that it improved their patient satisfaction, we believe that yes, it can improve the therapeutic alliance between patient and therapist. Great, there's no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a really interesting and uh, well done presentation. We will move to our third presenters of the morning. And so if the third group could please unmute yourselves. Our third presenters are Sydney Fournier, Michaela Lachance, and Melissa Parrish, and they will be presenting their study entitled, Does Blood Flow Restriction Training Improve Functional Outcomes in Physically Active Young Adults with Anterior Knee Pain? Their faculty advisor was Dr. Aaron Futrell, and their reader was uh, Andrew Millett. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Chauvin. Anterior knee pain is a common overuse musculoskeletal condition found in physically active young adults. Traditionally, high load quadricep strengthening is used to treat anterior knee pain, but it often increases the patient's pain and prevents the rehab progression. Blood flow restriction may be an alternative treatment for anterior knee pain. BFR occludes the venous blood flow while allowing some arterial flow. BFR promotes the metabolism in muscle cells by increasing the serum growth hormone and insulin growth factor one. Through this process, muscular hypertrophy can be seen and collagen is produced within the muscle to promote tissue repair and the recovery. BFR creates a hypoxic environment for the working muscle, causing proliferation of the muscle cells and making the muscle work harder to elicit a contraction. Using a BFR cuff allows lower loads to replace higher loads during quadricep strengthening. With a reduced load and less stress, pain may be reduced or eliminated. Next slide, please. Our question was inspired by a 20-year-old Division I collegiate baseball player who was experiencing right anterior knee pain. His pain was exacerbated during single limb and closed kinetic chain movements, such as squats, lunges, and pitching. Upon initial evaluation, the strength and the girth of his right lower extremity was less than his left. Initial physical therapy treatment consisted of traditional high-load quadriceps strength training, but did not reduce the pain with functional activities. After further examination by an orthopedist, the patient was referred back to PT, at which time low load BFR was applied. The patient had increased strength and reduced pain in three weeks. Alternative quadriceps strengthening is important to your anterior knee pain patients, aiming at increasing the strength, improving their function, and inducing hypoalgesia. Our research question then became, does blood flow restriction training improve functional outcomes in physically active young adults with anterior knee pain? Next slide, please. We set the inclusion and exclusion criteria to match our patient case and to provide an answer to our clinical question. A BFR device was operationally defined as any device that restricts blood flow during exercise, such as a BFR cuff or an elastic band. Physically active was defined as exercising regular, regularly at least three times per week. The final search strings and reference scanning led to a total of 57 articles. The articles chosen during reference scanning were based off title. The articles were eliminated if they did not pertain to the clinical question, if they were duplicates, did not meet the inclusion or exclusion criteria, or had limited to statistical analysis. After the appraisal process, five articles were considered for the clinical decision. Next slide, please. The five articles we appraised vary in design, but included higher levels of evidence. One article was a longitudinal crossover design, another was a cross-sectional repeated measures design, and the remaining three articles were randomized control trials. Two of our articles were written by the same author, and they both investigated the same research question. However, one was a higher level of evidence, and they used a control group. 
From the five appraised articles, the total number of subjects analyzed was, 100, was 197. Next slide, please. This slide highlights the important findings of each of the articles. Only the last article in the list did not find significant group differences following three weeks of low load BFR compared to high load resistance training. The article by Giles et al. is important to note because it was the only article to look at the effects of BFR long term. At eight weeks, the BFR group had a significant reduction in pain during activities of daily life. However, at six months, there were no differences between groups for any outcome measures evaluated, which included pain, function, and muscle size. The other three studies' results show that BFR was significant in reducing pain immediately after use and improving strength after three weeks. It should also be noted that every study had unique parameters for dosing for BFR application and exercises. None of the studies reported any adverse effects from using BFR. Next slide, please. The clinical implications of this literature review led us to conclude that BFR should be used in patients with anterior knee pain who cannot tolerate traditional quadriceps strengthening. This is especially true for patients during the early stages of rehab when pain is at higher levels. BFR allows patients to strengthen their quadriceps without additional load that could cause mechanical stress. This would reduce pain, increase strength, and increase exercise tolerance. However, not every clinician can use BFR or have it as an option to treat this population because it requires a certification and specialized equipment. There is also a lack of BFR research in our profession in terms of dosing, parameters, uses, populations, and long-term effects. We now welcome any questions. Oh, one question from Dr. Shevin. If the protocols are so varied, how should a therapist make, make a clinical decision about its use? I think that it would depend upon the patient. It would have to be specifically for the patient, what they have tried in the past, if they have tried anything, and what they're comfortable with starting out with. I think that's also going to depend on the clinical or like the continuing education course that they go to and the recommendations that they provide. You could also use articles that match your patient um, as close as possible, and you can go off of what that article states. Um, like we mentioned that we specifically looked at um, articles that had physically active young adults um, that exercise regularly, but if your patient was post-op or um, had some other type of condition, then you could find an article with more that suits your patient. They do have articles out there concerning the knee, the hip, shoulders, and all of that. So you can, like um, Melissa said and Michaela said, we can look at that for a specific patient. Good question from Dr. Kaufman. A curiosity about blood flow restriction training. In your background work, did you come across anything that explores whether low load training increases the likelihood of later injury or re-injury? Does it set someone up for a performance load that's larger, a larger multiplier of lower training load? All the outcomes you presented were short term. Unfortunately, we had to present that way just because BFR is a pretty recent idea in the research field, and it's not studied long term as of now. The latest that we found was about six months, and it had found no improvement of BFR over traditional training. Question from Dr. Shevin, why not use BFR from the start as opposed to waiting for traditional exercise to fail for anterior knee pain? I feel like uh, you could use BFR as an addition, like as your first treatment, especially early in rehab when your patient is experiencing a lot of pain. However, I feel like most therapists, they want to, when they're trying something new like that, they want to start off by using what is traditional and has been shown to work. Traditional quadriceps strengthening has been shown very positive outcomes with patients. However, there is that time period where they feel like, okay, they can't do the traditional quadriceps strengthening because their patient's so much pain and they get in this stuck point. And we believe that it is a great alternative to it because as of the research right now, it doesn't show 
that much more favorable outcomes, um, and there isn't long-term outcomes that shows more benefit than the other. Also, it's going off of that, um, we talked about sort of the limitations that not everybody has this option available to them. So they would have to make sure that they had the equipment and the certification and that they felt comfortable using it with the patient as well. Great. I have a question and then I'm going to get to Ryan and Jennifer's questions because they're kind of in the same genre. Um, I know you are looking at outcomes three weeks after initiating the BFR treatment and one of the outcomes that was looked at was muscle size. Now typically during resistance training, um, muscle size doesn't increase until six weeks and the increases in strength that we see in the first few weeks are typically um, attributed to neural changes. Um, in motor unit recruitment, etc. Um, why would that be an outcome? Would you expect that with blood flow restriction, there'd be a difference um, in muscle size after three weeks? Is the mechanism as far as um, the increase in muscle strength or what you're expecting to happen in the muscle different than what you would see with traditional resistance training? So BFR creates this metabolic environment and it's stimulating the anaero anaerobic pathways that are seen with traditional, traditional resistance training. However, it's due to the swelling for the initial neural pathways that traditionally shows the, the increase in diameter for the first couple weeks. And then it's later on that the muscle kind of fully adapts and then has permanent effects. So that was something we looked at, that there is a disproportion between the amount of hypertrophy seen and the amount of strength increases that are also gained. So that's something why we think long-term, when you look at the eight weeks and then again at the six months, why um, you see sort of similar outcomes. And that's why we recommended it for early use in rehab, because you see those initial gains right away. But then once you can transition the patient to normal, traditional quadricep strengthening, then they'll sort of even out um, to normal function and get the neural adaptations that you would see. Great. Question from Ryan. Is the increase in diameter for muscles engaged in BFR a myofibril change or just an increase in the sarcoplasma or sarcolemma size? So would the change be in functional strength or is it more of a cosmetic change? So that's kind of what I just said um, before. It is a little bit more cosmetic because the amount of hypertrophy that you have is indirectly related to the amount of strength gains that you see. There still is some increase in strength, but not as much as you would expect for the amount of hypertrophy that you would normally see in the eight weeks with traditional quadricep strengthening. And a question from Jen. Did you come across anything in the literature about the benefits of BFR in regards to endurance training versus strength training? Is it more effective for one versus the other? So, so we looked at, oh, sorry, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so we looked at mostly um, strength. However, we did come across like an article like very early in our stages that said that if you were to do endurance, it's the same thing as if you were just gonna do traditional resistance lower resistance, more reps is endurance, and it's the same way with BFR. You might not have as much occlusion, um, but you would do more reps and it would do more endurance as well. Um, however, most people use BFR as of right now in research for the initial strength gains and to get um, hypertrophy within the muscle. Um, there would need to be more research done, like specifically if you want to get endurance versus strength, um, what parameters to use, and for also the blood flow occlusion cuff itself, like how much pressure to use on it. Another question from Sean Sheridan. What barriers might you anticipate in suggesting BFR as a tool with your patients? And what have you found in your research in regards to risk with this intervention? So, so we haven't... Penny, you can go this time. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So as it comes to barriers that we might anticipate, it's kind of patient education, so whether the patient is comfortable in trying something new and if the therapist is certified in this kind of practice. When it comes to risk, the articles that we looked at were young and healthy athletes, so we saw no risk that those specific participants did have because that was our patient case. But we did come across an article or two suggesting that blood clots, certain blood conditions were a contraindication, but that was kind of out of our realm of research. 
from Carolyn. In regard to endurance, is there a time limit for how long the cuff can be inflated? Are you able to get true endurance training if you need to deflate it after a specific amount of minutes? So actually it was um, during our articles, each article was kind of different about how they inflated and deflated the cuff. Um, some articles they used during their rest period, they would deflate it every time. Other articles, they would do it. They would have it inflated throughout the entire set and through the amount of reps. So it was like right now there isn't much research, and we didn't specifically really look into endurance, um, like we mentioned before, about how the inflation and deflation of the cuff affects that. Um, however, I know that within the course itself, I know it's recommended to not leave this on for an hour straight. Um, so it would just definitely need more research itself on the amount of time to have it really on and be applying the pressure. Um, and like we mentioned before, articles right now are very variable and the amount of um, rest period from the cuff. So there would also need to be more research on the just like benefits and um, the like disadvantages to as well, like with the cuff pressure. Going along with what Michaela was saying, it's kind of difficult for a researcher to ask a participant to keep the um, the cuff on for as long as it takes to find like a contraindication of it or a risk to it. So there's kind of an ethical barrier there as well. Uh, one, I have a question and then Elena has a question as well. Um, you keep mentioning, you know, taking a course, being certified. However, anecdotally, I know that BFR is being used quite a bit in the um, strength and conditioning world. Personal trainers are using it. Um, physical therapists are using it. Athletic trainers are using it. Many of them have not, you know, done a quote unquote certification. Is there any um, APTA consensus statement or um, anything you know about as far as um, what is the appropriate amount of training required for a therapist to um, use this in the clinic? So I was actually trained in this back in December and the course that I took was an eight hour course and you had to go through all the pathophysiology and all of the history, and then you had to do an actual, I would say, workout on your own with the cuff and kind of teaching somebody else how to use it as well. So it's not suggested to use if you are not trained in it. There, You could um, occlude the blood vessels a little bit too much. There could be some numbing, some tingling, which is not what you're supposed to get from blood flow restriction. So I would say that if somebody is using the cuff and they are not trained, that they probably should not be using this and that their patient or their clients should probably be aware of that as well. Question from Elena, how would you explain the benefits of this treatment in lay terms to a patient? I would explain to the patient that by using this cuff, it's going to make really easy exercises seem very challenging and that you're going to do them for a long time to tire out the muscle. And by doing this, you'll have increased strength and it will hopefully also reduce the pain as well. Great. No further questions from the chat. Excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I would ask the final set of presenters for session one to unmute yourselves. So our last presentation of the morning is uh, uh, work done by Fletcher Comet and Marissa Witkowski. And uh, they are presenting their research entitled Evidence-Based Recommendations for Return to Running for Women Postpartum. Uh, their faculty advisor was Dr. Aaron Futrell, and their reader was Dr. Anna Burns. Thank you, Dr. Shevin. Many physiological changes occur during pregnancy and in the postpartum period, including weight gain, ligament laxity, and muscle weakness. The pelvic floor also becomes weak due to stretch or possible tearing during birth. This situation essentially makes women who want to return to running novice. There is also very little guidance for return to running postpartum. These factors, along with overtraining and a previous history of running injury, put postpartum women at a higher risk of injury. Next slide, please. Our patient was 10 weeks postpartum. She was previously active with running and CrossFit. She presented to physical therapy with pelvic girdle pain with running, and her goal was to return to running pain-free. In general, guidelines for women to return to running 
or to be um, to return or begin exercise during the postpartum period are lacking. Our purpose was to determine evidence-based recommendations to allow postpartum women to return to running. Next slide, please. Our search included all levels of evidence dated back to 2000. Due to a lack of evidence during our initial search, we did not limit the types of articles we included to make our clinical decision. A postpartum individual was operationally defined as a vaginal delivery of a baby within the past year. And we def operationally defined previously active as routinely engaging in physical activity directly prior to giving birth. We found in the research that individuals who weren't active prior to or during pregnancy would have a different return to exercise plan compared to an individual who was active during that time. And we also excluded cesarean births due to their post-surgical nature. Next slide, please. So we have raised eight articles total, but only included five in our clinical decision. These included the two subject reviews, one expert opinion, and two randomized control trials. The two subject reviews examined existing international guidelines from countries like Canada, UK, Australia, and the United States surrounding postpartum women's rehabilitation processes. The expert opinion guideline was the only one who attempted to review postpartum individuals return to running. And this would just come out this year. Um, and then the two RCTs supported the efficacy of pelvic floor exercises to decrease pelvic girdle pain. Next slide, please. So what we did was we compiled the evidence and results from the existing literature and produced this chart that highlights the most important steps an individual should follow to return to running postpartum. So as you can see, it ranges from the first day postpartum to six months with some activities slated to begin at later times. So the program should always start with medical clearance and a pelvic floor exam from a PT specialist within the first six weeks. The pelvic floor exam will help to identify conditions such as pelvic organ prolapse sexual dysfunction, or higher than normal tone in the pelvic floor musculature. So even just seeing the specialist for one visit is beneficial before trying to start these exercises on your own. The early weeks, the patient should focus on pelvic floor and stability exercises before they can transition to higher level activities, such as the running or asymmetrical movements. It's important to have that foundational strength within the abdominal and pelvic floor musculature. So exercises like supine bridge, posterior pelvic tilts, adduction squeezes, and bird dogs are great starting places to build that foundational strength needed to counteract the high impact loads during running. So after this foundational strength is accomplished, individuals can then work on load management. This means performing exercises that mimic the load exerted on the pelvis when running. Asymmetrical movements such as the single leg balance or single leg hopping are great ways to slowly progress the patient to high impact activities after three months. So all during those initial weeks, we want to make sure that the individual is also doing some low intensity aerobic exercise, including walking or biking. That way, when they go into running after three months, it's not a shock to the cardiovascular system. Um, so at that three month mark, a patient may begin running at the one to two minutes per day, keeping their RPE under 13 or just somewhat hard. And it's really important important as they're progressing their duration and distance is that we really want them to do some self clearance and make sure that they feel comfortable progressing to each uh, stage of that running. Next slide. Thank you. So as a PT, it's important to make sure the postpartum patient has received medical clearance and uh, prior to starting a return to running progression. So we recommend that at least the patient gets a consult with a pelvic floor specialist to to see maybe give some exercises and tell them you know how, how long it should take for them to to do um, the rehabilitation and what's going wrong or good in their body so as for the future research we really need some more cohort studies um, so that we can do more systematic reviews and do um, a clinical practice guideline for individuals this is an area of research that is not discussed right now um, and it needs to be as high level athletes such around the world, such as Serena Williams are starting to voice their struggles with returning to sport after pregnancy. That's it. Thank you. Um, first question from Carolyn Trottier. Did any literature mention abdominal and pelvic floor work throughout pregnancy to ease return to athletics? Yeah, there was a there was a good amount of research saying that um, you know during pregnancy individuals can do you know pelvic floor exercises and that's going to help them return uh, after postpartum. But we really want to focus what they can do after the postpartum period 
um, because I feel like a lot of individuals don't see a specialist or anything like that, and they start thinking about that, what they can do after that uh, postpartum period. From Dr. Varys, what is the criteria for medical clearance, and who is the ideal provider to give this designation? So we, the existing literature says that the someone's gynecologist or any of their um, medical health professionals, such as their primary care doctor, are good people to um, give that medical clearance. But I believe the the international um, guidelines said the gynecologist. Yeah, they did say that, and that they they should be seeing their OBGYN kind of at that six week point, anyways. So just checking with them and letting them know, like, this is a goal of yours to return to running, um, just so they can make sure, like, medically, the side of it is all clear. And Dr. Kaufman, if a runner is asymptomatic postpartum, is a physical exam, as you described, still necessary? If so, how much strength is required to tolerate the loads associated with running, and how would that be measured? So I think, um, to answer the first part, even if they're asymptomatic, it would be it would be good to still get an exam from a pelvic floor specialist because they might have some higher tone that they're not aware of that could cause problems later on when they try to do more high impact loads. Um, and as far as the the strength, I think overall, um, it's just like after you have give birth, the your your muscles tend to lax a little bit. So um, building up that strength over the sixth week, regardless of what period you're on. Um, should be beneficial for the individual to, to start before they run. It's increasing the loads as well and just making sure they're pain-free through it. Um, you don't want to keep increasing the load when they're having more pain, so it's kind of working with the patient and seeing how they're feeling. Thank you. A question from Allison. Would a condition such as stress urinary incontinence prior to the pregnancy delay the progress of an individual postpartum? So our patient did have stress urinary incontinence prior to the pregnancy. So it could, um, she could have already had some pelvic floor dysfunction going on. So that's why it's very important to have that PT pelvic floor exam just to see where they're at. Because um, a lot of these exercises could also help down the road with that stress urinary incontinence. Question from Haley Serpa. How would you apply your program recommendation to your patient at 10 weeks postpartum? I think it'd still be beneficial to do the foundational exercises even at that timeline. Um, you can always, um, you know, as we are progressing, the asymmetrical movements are beneficial. So maybe just keep giving them exercises that they can take home and over the future keep doing um, in addition to the running so that they always have that strength. And that the timeline is all, is not like set in stone. So if you do see someone more 10 weeks postpartum that the timeline just kind of gets pushed back. So they might not be starting running exactly at three months postpartum, but more three months since they started this return progression. From Dr. Buchel, in my experience, nearly every patient from Europe is referred to physical therapy following birth. Do the international and US guidelines match in any way for this criteria? The no. international, oh, sorry, Marissa. The, so we, the international guidance we had, there were six different ones in this article that compared them, and they were kind of all over the place. They didn't always make the same recommendations. So as regard to seeing a physical therapist, um, they weren't always on, like, the same page of saying yes, but there wasn't any ones that said no not to see it. It just kind of left it out of their recommendation. Yeah, I know the U.S. one didn't mention physical therapist. They just said um, get cleared by your health professional before attempting anything, and that was really what they left it at. From Dr. Shevin, what creates this variation in the guidelines? Hmm. I think we're not doing a good job um, getting the word out to everyone, and um, maybe it's just, I don't know if they do, like, summit meetings internationally, but I think that will be beneficial or a beneficial topic to bring up. Um, to make sure that maybe we can get something that everyone is standardized about and would, you know, begin to do research on. And a lot of it is expert opinion. Um, so they're trying to, they need more research to back their opinion on it. Um, so I think that just plays a role into there being a difference and like a variation in their guidelines is because they're not really supporting it with the research yet. How 
how does culture and the health system play into the guideline development? I think maybe some individuals also don't want to run or get back to exercise afterwards, and so maybe that's not a priority. I think also, too, with um, there's just a lot going on after a mother does have a baby of just complete lifestyle changes, um, where we found a lot of the research is more focused on like medical conditions, such as like postpartum depression. Um, so they're not focusing in on running, even though we found that running is important to, there are a lot of women who want to return to running postpartum. So I think it's just looking into like the cultural and how, um, like the health system is more just focused on the medical side of the women's return after delivery versus kind of getting back into that lifestyle of exercising and running. Do you think collaborating with OBGYN clinics would help get this information conveyed to patients, i.e. having physicians know that we can contribute to the collaborative care? Yeah, I think since there's a high body of evidence saying us PT pelvic floor examination is beneficial in, in recognizing things like the pelvic organ prolapse and, and Contents, which I'm sure they can too, but it would be beneficial that um, if they just refer us to the PT, they know that we can then target those um, impairments. And even like we, um, when you look at like an outpatient ortho clinic, there's some of those clinics that are attached to an orthopedic office so they can see their orthopedic surgeon or doctor at the same time as seeing the PT visit. So if something down the road looking into having like PT pelvic floor specialists in an OBGYN and office so they're able to collaborate and really work on um, just helping the women return to the exercise and getting all that medical care that they need. And this is from Dr. Futrell. Having done this research, do you feel compelled to educate physicians about the benefits of pelvic floor PT? Yeah, I definitely think it's an area that we could definitely help with. So there's, you know, it's a, also a population that isn't you know, focused on a lot, I feel like, in, or thought of as the, you know, an outpatient clinic setting. So I think especially um, anyone can really do it. So I think we should definitely educate physicians and say, hey, we can, we can refer them to us. We can, we can help them rehab and get to a place where they can return to what they love doing beforehand. And I think educating other PTs as well. Like one of the things we found was that you don't have to be a pelvic floor specialist to be able to help them along with a graded rehab program. So being able to refer them to a pelvic floor specialist for that exam, but then knowing that if you've been working with them for a while, they could come back to you and you could help them go through this return to running progression. You don't have to be a specialist to be able to do that.